Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on name mapping with Test Complete. My name is Nick Olivo, and over the course of the next 30 or 40 minutes, we'll discuss how you can get name mapping to reliably and identify and locate objects in your Test Complete tests. Now, before we get started, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me okay. So if you could please locate the Q&A panel on your screen. If it's not visible right now, like what you see right here, it's probably been minimized down to this small toolbar, which you'll see in the top right corner of your screen. Just go ahead and click on the arrow button right there. That'll expand the panel back to its full size. And if you can hear me okay, just type the word sound into that panel, just so I know that everybody can hear me all right. Okay, good. Folks are chiming in there. Outstanding. Okay, and if you can see my mouse moving in the top right corner of the screen right now, just go ahead and type the word mouse or visual or whatever, just so that I know that everybody can see and that the refresh rate is good. Fantastic. All right. Okay, so before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, for starters, we are recording this session, and you'll be receiving a link to that recording a little later on this week or early next week. Second, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. I'll try and field some questions real time as well if I can. Uh, but one thing to note is that the Q&A session is only intended for what we talk about today. So if you have questions that go beyond name mapping, you know, you're curious about if Test Complete can run virtual environments, or you're having a particular troubleshooting scenario, this is not the right place for those kinds of questions. You're going to be better off talking to the support team or to your account representative to get the best information there. All right, so today we're going to start out with a look at the basics of name mapping, followed by some common troubleshooting techniques, and then I'll spend a few minutes talking about name mapping templates. And then finally, we'll round things out with the Q&A session. So let's do a quick review of what TestComplete's name map is used for. For starters, it stores information about all the objects you've recorded against. So every button that you've clicked, every text field you've typed into, every box that you've checked, information about all those objects is stored inside TestComplete's name map. Second, it also stores those objects' overall hierarchy. So in addition to the button that you clicked, you're also going to see all the parent controls for that button. Next, the name map is also used to determine what properties and what values for those properties will be used when identifying an object. For example, maybe you've got a button called OK. Test Complete may use that button's caption property and the value of OK as an identifier for that particular control. And finally, the name map is used to define aliases, which allow you to customize how Test Complete will refer to certain objects in a given test. All right, so let's jump out of PowerPoint here, and let's take a look at the name mapping editor inside of Test Complete. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of PowerPoint, and I'm going to share my desktop here. There we go. Okay. And as you can see, I've already got Test Complete loaded up here, and I am currently showing a test that I recorded a little earlier today. This is a very, very simple test, which is just recording, uh, clicking inside the notepad window that I've got right here and typing the word hello. That's all this test does. Okay, so let's take a look at the notepad window inside the name mapping editor. To do that, all you have to do is right click on the item in question and say show object in name mapping editor. And now test complete jumps us into the name map. And the name map itself is broken into three parts. Let's take a look at each one of those parts right now. This part right here, this mapped objects panel, this is where we store the overall object hierarchy and where we can define which properties will be used for object recognition. Okay? And in fact, if you want to change which properties are being used, you can do that simply by selecting the object you want to work with, let's say the edit window here, and then you can right click on it and say edit. And now here's a list of all the properties that Test Complete can see for that control. We could make any one of these properties identifiers for use in recognizing this object. Right now you can see we're just using the class, which is edit, but maybe we also wanted this ID. We could add that as well just by clicking that left facing arrow. And now when the test runs, it's going to be looking to see that we have a control whose class is edit and an ID of uh, this number right here. Okay, I'm just going to put this back the way it was. So that's how you can uh, view the structure of your application as well as modify which properties are being used in order to uh, recognize an object. This panel here on the right-hand side of the screen shows which properties are currently being used to uh, define and identify an object, as well as what the expected values are. So again, in this case, we're looking for a WND class property whose value is edit. Then we've also got this aliases palette down here. And you may be looking at this and saying, well, Nick, aliases, 
Uh, I'm sorry, folks. It seems like there's some interference on the line. If you don't have your line muted, if you could please do that, that would be terrific. Thanks. Um, so what you can see here uh, on the aliases section it looks a lot like what you see up top there in the mapped objects section. And what's going on there is aliases allow you to define how we're going to refer to a particular control in tests. For example, right now we're calling that edit box edit. Not a great uh, name for overall testing purposes. I may want to use a slightly different name here. Let's say I want to call that the notepad text window. Well, I can do that. I can just right click here, say rename, and change this to notepad text window. Press enter, and now you're going to notice that test complete is going to pop up a box that says, hey, you're already using this in your keyword tests. Do you want me to automatically update your tests to use this new name? And we'll say yes to that. So now when I come back into my notepad test, you can see that test complete has automatically updated all instances of that edit object with notepad text window. So we make the change once, and the name map propagates that change out everywhere uh, where that's using that particular object. So this saves you the aggravation of having to hunt through every test you ever created to you know, update reference to a control so that it makes a little more sense. So that's the basics of the name mapping window and what it can do. All right, so now you're saying, well, that, that makes sense, Nick. I, I understand that. Um, but really, what else can the aliases do? Why is the, the hierarchy replicated in that way? Well, by default, we're replicating the hierarchy, but you can shorten the hierarchy in the aliases panel as well. And typically, people do this most often when they're working in script. So for example, let me jump over to this script editor window I've got right here. And let's say I wanted to programmatically type into that uh, notepad main window. The way I do that is by typing aliases dot, and then I'd say notepad dot, uh, wnd notepad dot, notepad text window dot set text, and you can see here that's a long line of text that I have to type. Aliases can actually help you shorten this up, and the way we're going to do that is we come back into the name mapping palette. I'm going to grab this alias, and I'm going to move that. I'm just going to pull it right out of the hierarchy so it's at its own level in the hierarchy. It's at the root level right now. And I just gra grabbed that and dragged it down in order to make it happen. Okay, so okay. now, instead of typing aliases.notepad.wnd, yada, 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 all I have to do is type aliases.notepad text window. And then I can set its text directly. So the, um, oops, should have been set text, not set focus. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, so that is how you can use aliases to make your tests shorter. So instead of these extraneous commands here that we don't care about, we can just make it so that we go right down to that level. That's what you can use aliases for. All right. So now when you're working with your test complete tests, chances are you're going to come across a situation when you encounter the uh, dreaded object not found error message. So let's talk about what you can do in order to uh, help with that. So I've, there are four ways that you can troubleshoot elements inside of Test Complete's name map so that you can successfully locate the controls that you care about. And we're going to talk through each one of these approaches in turn. And it's important to note that these approaches uh, can be applied to either Windows or web-based applications. So it's not like name mapping only applies to one type of application testing. All right, so let's go ahead and we're going to go back to our uh, sample application there, our sample machine, and we are going to create some tests that will help us highlight these particular scenarios inside our uh, test. Um, Lee is asking if I can mute everybody. I have tried. Unfortunately, it seems that someone has dialed in and is not connected up in such a way that I can mute them. So if you have not muted your phone, folks, please, I, I would appreciate it if you could do that. Thank you. Um, okay, so here we are. I've got a brand new project that I've already created here. And what I want to do is record some tests against uh, an application that I've got running locally. This is going to be a, uh, actually showing you one of the other Smart Bear products that we have called Code Collaborator, which is used to create peer reviews of your code. So if you guys have a need for that tool, you might want to check this out. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to go ahead and just start recording a new test. I've already got Test Complete wired up so that it will automatically invoke uh, my browser and take me right out to the URL I want to go to, so I don't need to do anything there. And the first thing I want to do here is log in as an admin. And when I log in as an admin, I want to go over to my administrative section here. And I'm going to edit one of my user's information. I'm going to go into the users tab over here. 
Alright, and now you can see I've got a list of users down at the bottom of my screen here. I'm going to click on Arthur here. I'm going to click his edit link. And I'm going to edit Arthur's information so that Arthur has a phone number. And we'll give Arthur the phone number of 8675309, the most famous phone number in the history of the world. So we'll give him that. We'll click Save. And once Arthur's information has been saved, we're going to log off. And we're going to close the browser down and stop recording. Okay, and as usual, Test Complete's going to generate um, our test case based on the actions we just performed. Here they are. And you can see we're just going along here. We're going to log in as Arthur. We'll set his text to 8675309 and so on and so forth. Okay, so now that we've got that created, let's try running this back. So I'm just going to go ahead and click Run here. And Test Complete will fire off and perform that same sequence of actions. Once again, if everybody could please mute your telephone, I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, so would some of the other folks on the line who are asking me to do that. I'm trying, folks. Uh, I've muted everybody that I can, but there are a couple of folks who are uh, outside my scope of power right now, it seems. Um, okay, so uh, right now we're going to go in, and we are looking, you can see right there, we're looking for the link edit object in the top right corner of my screen. Test complete is saying it's looking for a link edit object. It can't find it, so we're stopping our test, and we're going to go back into our uh, test log here. We can see that we've got that message. There it is. I'm sure everybody's encountered it at one point or another. The object does not exist. Okay, so let's take a look at the information that's shown here in the remarks panel. You're seeing two things here right now. First is the tested object. This is the object that test complete is actually trying to manipulate, and you can see the full path to it along with the mapping item. And then down here, this section, this is the object that we couldn't find. So I'm just going to scroll to the right here. And in this case, you can see what we were actually looking for is this link edit. That's actually Arthur's edit hyperlink. And then right here, this is the control we couldn't locate, this panel title box with that uh, alphanumeric string after it. So in the overall chain, we couldn't find this particular object. That's where our breakdown is. So what we want to do now is go into Test Complete's name map take a look at this control and see what we are expecting to see as opposed to what we see right now. So I'm going to just click on this link edit object link right here. That'll jump me to that in the name map. And then I'm going to come right here. There's our, our panel that we were looking for. And you can see it's panel, text, uh, title box, and then a whole lot of numbers and letters. Okay, so what I'm going to do right now is take a look at what Test Complete currently sees that object as. So I'm going to click this object spy button right here. And I'm going to drag the Finder tool over Arthur's Edit Hyperlink. So we'll just select that. OK, release the mouse. And now Test Complete's going to capture a reference to that control, just like always. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click this button right here in the Object Spy, which says Highlight in the Object Tree. And what that's going to do is show me where this object is currently falling in the overall object hierarchy. OK, and now we can see here that Here's our, our hyperlink, there's, there's Arthur's edit link, and then here's our title box, a couple of levels up. And right now, we are looking for a title box that starts with 2C8. But in the name map, we were looking for a title box that started with B72. So what we've got here is a control that's dynamically generated, meaning that every time our test runs, that particular identifier is going to change. So this time around, it's B72. Next time, it'll be C49. The time after that, it could be Q18. You never know. So what we want to do is wildcard this entry in name map in the name map. So basically, we'll tell test complete, I don't care about anything that looks like this. All I care about is this piece right here. So as long as we can find that title box, I'll be happy. So what we're going to do is just click inside these fields right here, click the ellipses, and I'm going to change this long alphanumeric string to an asterisk. And I'm going to do that for both the object identifier and the ID string properties. And what this does is this is effectively telling Test Complete, OK, at some level here, we've got an object called uh, title box. And it's going to have something after an underscore. I don't care what that something is, just find me that title box. And then as a result of that, Test Complete will then be able to find the other controls in the uh, hierarchy. So I'm going to close my browser down here. Let's try running our test again.
Now, wild cards can be used in more than just the name map. would like to mention that while the test runs. Uh, wild cards can also be used in things like property checkpoints. So if you want to make sure that your uh, text on screen maybe matches just a particular pattern or a particular substring within that pattern, uh, Test Complete can do that via uh, wild cards as well. So here we are. We're on that page. And wonderful. We just clicked Arthur's uh, telephone number or edit link. Then we're going to set his text equal to 8675309. And then uh, we'll save the changes, log out, close down. So we were able to actually uh, recognize that control. Actually, it looks like we're going to have another scenario here where we couldn't find a cell that uh, inside of our test. Probably going to be the same scenario, in fact, where we can't locate that particular control. Let's see what test complete comes back with. Uh, again, yep, uh, similar thing here where a panel is probably being rendered differently. So again, we'd walk through that same process to wildcard that uh, element and then test complete will be able to locate it and find it consistently. So, you know, really straightforward when you're working with the wild carding. You just find the element that uh, has the dynamically generated value or the, the bit of text that's changing, put the star in there, and then test complete will be able to locate the control and move on with your tests. Okay, so that's wild carding. And like I said, that's probably the, the simplest tweak that you can make from a name mapping perspective. But now what happens if the object that you're looking for has stable properties, uh, but some other controls in the hierarchy don't, you know, and, and there's a lot of those controls. What, what happens then? Well, let's look at a scenario that illustrates that right now. I'm going to start recording a new test. And again, we're going to, let me close my, my browser down here just so that we've got that clean. Okay. Again, Test Complete logs me uh, right up and takes me to my, my web page. I'm going to log in here as Barry. And what Barry wants to do today is create a brand new code review. So we're just going to go up here and we're going to say uh, new review. We're going to fill in some information here. We're going to call this uh, Barry's review. And uh, in order for Barry to actually create a review, he needs to find some people who will participate in that review. So we're going to click right here. We're going to say uh, Barry is the author. We'll choose author from this, and we'll say Barry. And then uh, for a reviewer, we're going to pick reviewer here. We'll make Bruce Barry's reviewer. So we'll say that Bruce is going to do that. All right, fantastic. And then we'll come down here, and we'll click Apply. OK. And then we will log off and close the browser down and stop recording. Now I'm going to just take a quick shortcut here, folks, and tell you that this particular test will not run because when it tries to play back, it won't be able to find Bruce inside of our test. So here we are. This is where we are clicking Bruce's name inside our test case. You can see where my mouse is right now. So I'm going to right-click on Bruce here, and I'm going to say Show Object in Name Mapping Editor. Okay, so here we are. We're inside the Name Mapping Editor. There's Bruce. Now we look here. You can see that we've got panel ext gen 66 and panel ext gen 65. Uh, those are both parent controls for Bruce. What's going to happen here when this test tries to replay is test complete won't be able to find this control, panel ext gen 65. It won't be able to find panel ext gen 66 because both of these names are dynamically generated. So 65 will change to something else, and then 66 will change to something else. So wild carding in this case, yeah, we could do it, but it's going to wind up being a lot of wild carding, or you know, especially if you've got a very complicated website that may have you know 10 or 12 levels deep. Uh, so instead of wild carding the element, what we're going to do is use a feature called extended find. Okay, so extended find basically lets you say, hey, test complete. I'm looking for an object called panel Bruce. It's got these properties right here. Go find it for me. All right, so let's, let's see how we set that up. First thing we need to do is enable extended find for this control. So what we're going to do is right-click on panel Bruce down here and say find mapped object. And that's going to jump me up to the mapped object section. Remember, it's the mapped object section that allows you to actually edit the controls and what properties are used to recognize those controls. And it's also what allows you to specify um, uh, when you want to turn on extended find for those controls. So here's how we do that. First of all, you're going to see this extended find checkbox right here. We're going to want to click that. If you don't see the extended find box by default, just right click on these headers up here, go to field chooser, and there'll be a 
uh, extended find header here, just drag that right onto these columns, and that will allow you to turn on extended find. Okay, so we've got extended find for Bruce, and we've said check, and we've checked it, so that's great. But the problem is, right now, the only place we're searching for this object is where we first found it originally. That is to say, we're looking for the object at this exact spot in the hierarchy, and that's not going to help us because that hierarchy won't exist. Think about it kind of like this. Imagine that one day you go to get your car keys, and they're not on the dresser where you left them. But now imagine that the only place you go to look for your car keys is that same spot in the dresser. Well, they're not there once. They're never going to be there. You've got to broaden your search. You want to go look in the kitchen. You want to look in your coat pockets. You want to see if one of your kids walked off with them. And what we need to do is tell Test Complete to broaden its search. So the way you do that is simply by dragging the control here in the mapped object section, drag that up to the most stable parent in the hierarchy. So in my case, I'm going to drag it up to this page preferences for Arthur. Now you can see that Bruce is a child of that object of that parent object. So what we're saying here is, okay, somewhere on the page preferences for Arthur, there is a control called Bruce, who is a panel with an identifier of six. Go find it, and then Test Complete will look through it. This is kind of like you saying, okay, I'm going to go look for my keys in the kitchen. Test Complete will go look for this panel on that uh, web page. We're going to need to do something similar for another part of our test, the place where we actually select the reviewer remark. Uh, that will be a similar thing. I'm going to show that in the name mapping editor as well, and I'm just going to repeat the process. Again, we find the mapped object, and you can see here, this one is also inside of dynamically generated controls, 63 and 64. So we'll turn on extended find, we'll drag it up to the uh, most stable parent in the hierarchy, and there we go, now we'll be able to replay this test. So let's go ahead and we'll just uh, run this test right now. Uh, so extended find is really handy for those situations when you've got a lot of dynamically generated parent controls, but the target controls themselves are static. You know, there are some times when wildcarding just isn't enough, uh, and this is a, a great way to work with that. So here we go, we're going to log in, we'll create that review uh, for Barry. Okay, now, uh, once we get done with this, we're going to shift gears and we'll talk about another feature inside of the name mapping editor that will help you out. Okay, so here we go. We're able to select um, our author, and we're going to pick Barry from that author list. For some reason, these controls were, were uh, good enough that they'd work repeatedly, uh, but now, but the author ones wouldn't. So now here we go. This time around, there we go. We got the reviewer, and now we'll get Bruce, and our test will finish out and run successfully. Okay, so uh, that's the extended find side of things. Okay, and... There we go. Okay. Now, test has finished out, and we see our test results. Everything's going to be successful there. So fantastic. So that change took away the object was not, or object does not exist uh, error message. Okay. So we've talked about wildcarding and extended find. Now I want to talk to you about another feature called uh, required children. Everything we've talked about today has to do with controls that are dynamically generated. But that's not the only reason an object may not be able to be identified. Sometimes there are multiple instances of an object on screen, and none of those objects have a unique set of properties that can be used to differentiate between them. So let, let's have a look at that right now. I'm going to bring up the uh, client GUI right here for Code Collaborator. This is actually a little uh, standalone Java application, but the concept could be applied to the uh, website of things as well. So I'm just going to expand this guy right here. And take this down. You'll notice that when I expand this, here we go, uh, there are a bunch of these composite objects. So I'm just going to zoom in on this a little bit here. You can see I've got 16 different composite objects listed here, 1 through 16. And under the covers, all of these objects are identical from you know, the programmatic perspective. They're all just panels. And in order to differentiate between them, Test Complete is relying on the order in which they were rendered on screen. Now, chances are, that's fine, and these may never change. We could record our tests, and they may run absolutely perfectly 100,000 times. But sooner or later, what's going to happen is the item right now that's number two is going to render slightly faster than the item right now that's number one. And as a result, we're not going to be able to find the controls we're looking for. You can see right here, number two has this add CVS diffs button, whereas number one has an add subversion diffs button. So if these render out of order, what's going to happen is Test Complete will be looking for the wrong button in the wrong location. So what we want to do 
is tell TestComplete to differentiate between these composite objects by focusing on their children as opposed to the properties of the object themselves. So let's go ahead and, and do that. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to map this object right from the object browser. I'm just going to say map object. And I'm just going to say, yes, I'm just going to blitz through this screen really fast. Click OK. I just want to get this entry into the name map. You'll notice that I just had a message pop up that said, hey, that object doesn't have unique properties with it. And yes, I know. We're going to fix that. OK. So here we go. We just had that item shown in the name mapping editor. Here we go. We'll bring it up. OK. You can see here's the, the hierarchy here. Shell, composite, 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 button. OK. Now this composite, this is the one that is at the level with all the other composites. You can see right now we're identifying it based on its index. The caption is blank and we're looking at the Java class name, but the only way we can really tell what it is is by going through the index. That's not helpful. What we want to do instead is tell it, hey, I want you to look for the button, the subversion button. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to delete the index from the list of properties that are being used to recognize this. I'm just going to right click on it and say edit. And then I'm going to come down here to the required children button. And I'm going to click this button. Now, this button right here has these properties associated with it, ab subversion diffs, and it's a regular um, Eclipse widget. So we are going to look for a button called add subversion diffs when we're looking for this particular control. We turn on required children, and this will only uh, look for a button that has the add subversion text. So that means that when this test runs, we're always going to be finding the correct parent control for this particular object by turning on required children. It makes it really easy for you to differentiate. If you have things in your website that don't have uh, unique identifiers, I saw this happen with a customer actually about a week or two ago. Uh, she had a bunch of iframes inside her application. None of them were uniquely uh, recognizable, but by keying off of the children, we were able to get her tests running successfully. So this is a nice way for you to uh, help find the right controls uh, in your tests. Okay. Now the last thing I want to talk about is conditional mode inside of name mapping. And this is when you have times in your tests when a single control's properties may change depending on uh, user input or maybe your application renders controls slightly differently on different operating systems. Uh, for example, maybe your save dialog is actually called save on Windows XP, but it's called save file on Windows Vista. In cases like that, Test Complete provides a feature called conditional name mapping. All right, so here, let, let's go back to my little uh, sample Java application right here. You'll notice right here I've got this button in the bottom corner of my screen here marked validate. Okay, when you click that button, its caption changes to OK. So depending on the application state, I always want to be able to find that button. So here, let's start out. I'm just going to, again, I'm going to map that object really quick. Uh, I'm going to use the map object button, which I got to just by clicking this guy right here. Normally, when you record your tests, Test Complete will automatically map objects as you go. But if you need to, you can add them by hand, which is what I'm doing right now. And again, I'm just going to click through this wizard really quick. Um, we'll call that shell one. And we'll just go right down the line. OK, so now we've got our uh, button right here. And you can see that right now we're calling it, um, we're keying off of the name validate. Let me expand the guy in the, the tree all the way here. Okay. So right now we are looking for a button whose caption is validate. Okay. But when I click that button, now we're looking for a button called OK, and you know we won't be able to find it because, hey, the object doesn't exist. So what we're going to do instead is tell Test Complete, I want you to look for a button whose caption is either validate or OK. And the way we do that is by turning on conditional mode. So just like what we did earlier for extended find, I'm going to right click here and say find mapped objects. That'll jump me up to the button here in the mapped object section. And I'm going to right click on this guy and say edit. Oops. Hang on one second, folks. Click the wrong button there. Ooh. OK, got away from me. All right, we're back. OK, so we right click, we say edit. And now what we can see here is we are looking for the button marked validate. Okay, I'm going to click this conditional mode button right here. And what you can see now is we're going to specify some logic that will say, okay, test complete, find me a button whose class equals uh, widgets.button and a caption of either validate or something else. So here's how we do that. We click in the caption we want to, or the property, I should say, that we want to create an and or an or statement with. I'm going to click or right here. 
And you can see test complete has drawn in these parentheses. We're going to say, all right, this ca caption, we can look for either the window caption equal to validate, or we can pick a different property. And again, I'm going to choose the WD caption. I want to keep the same one here. I'm going to make sure that equals, and we'll set that equal to a string of OK. All right, now, uh, one thing to note, folks, if you are selecting a property here in this screen and you don't see all the properties you're expecting, uh, chances are the object may not be visible or may not be live on screen right now. In order to see all the properties that are available, you need to have the, um, this, the object live on screen. So uh, if you see a, don't see everything you're looking for, that's probably what the problem is. All right, so right now we are going to look for a button whose uh, class is button and has a caption equal to validate or has a caption equal to OK. So we'll click, all right, now we can just verify this. We'll click highlight. All right, so there it is as validate. I'll come back in here. I'll click it. Now it's OK. Click highlight again. There it is. So now we've been able to successfully locate the control regardless of what its caption is. We can do it as validate or as OK. All right. Now, Let's talk about name mapping templates. That's the last thing I want to discuss before I turn things over to the questions that you folks have. We talked a little earlier about how you can right click on an object and edit its properties that are used for object recognition. So like in the case of the button we just worked with, we can say edit and we can set uh, these properties here. But maybe you want to change how Test Complete works with a particular object by default. Um, maybe the standard properties that are being used, like Java class name and caption, aren't what you want to use. Maybe you want to use a different set of properties to identify an object, and you want to have Test Complete use those properties every time it encounters a, an object of that type, as opposed to having to um, you know, go in and make the change for every instance of that particular item. Here's how you do that. You're going to create a name mapping template just by coming down here into the uh, name mapping editor. You right click anywhere there's some white space and you say add template. And then you use the finder tool to select an object on screen that you want to create the template for. So let's use the button right here, the OK button. Actually, I use the cancel button because that'll be unique. We'll say cancel. OK. I've already mapped the, the OK button. All right, so we've got our, our cancel button in there. All right, now I'm going to say add. And what you see here is a dialog that allows you to generate your name mapping template. We'll give our template a more descriptive name. I'll call this the Java button template. And now there are two sets of columns that I want you to, to take note of here. The first is the active column, and the second is the store column you see right here. The active column, these are the properties that we're going to look at when we determine if this template should be applied to the object we're looking at. So this is saying, okay, I want to look for an object of type widgets.button, okay, and if you find an object of widgets type dot button, then use this template to determine what properties we're going to use to recognize that. All right, so we are going to use that as the active property. The store column is which properties will actually be used to, or which properties will be used for identification purposes inside of Test Complete. So in our case here, I'd say we probably want to use the Java class name and maybe the text. Let's just come down here. Maybe I want to use that instead of the um, uh, caption. Okay, so I've got those two properties defined. I'm going to click OK. You can see here Test Complete has built my uh, template for me. All right, and I'll click Close. And now when we work with that particular button, if we record against it, let's go ahead and do that now. I'll just start recording. And I'll click the Cancel button. And then we'll stop recording. Test Complete will recognize that object, or will enter an object in that. Let me try that again. Test Complete will enter properties in the name map based on our selections that we just made here. So let me just right click. And there we go. There's the Java class name and the text, as opposed to what we saw earlier, which was the full class name and the caption. So you can create templates that will allow you to recognize controls based on your own special sets of identifiers. So if you find that your developers haven't specified a caption for anything in your application, or they haven't specified a good name or whatever, but there's a different property inside there that you can key off of that will always be consistent and always uh, be unique, then you can use a name mapping template to use that to uh, recognize those objects going forward. OK, so let's go ahead and we're going to jump back into our PowerPoint slides here, and we will 
show this screen. All right, so let's turn things over to the questions that you folks have. Again, if you have any questions, just go ahead and type those right into the Q&A panel. And let's see here. Our first question from David is, how does it distinguish between multiple controls if uh, there are multiples of controls and you are using wildcards? Okay, David, so in that case, if you've got multiple controls at the same level that are all using um, or th that a wildcard could match, like let's say you wildcarded too much of a particular object, then what you might see is an entry in the test complete log file that says ambiguous recognition. And in that case, that's a, uh, an indicator that maybe wildcarding uh, isn't the right approach for that particular control. Um, maybe you've wildcarded too much. Uh, that's another possibility. You know, if you should have wildcarded just the last three characters and instead you wildcarded the last 13, uh, that might be an indicator there. Um, and so what I recommend there is if you haven't wildcarded too much, take a look at one of the other approaches we talked about today and try that instead. Uh, Robert asks, when changing the hierarchy and using extended find in the name mapping panel, do should you uh, make the same change in the aliases panel? For readability's sake, Robert, yeah, it's usually a good idea to make that type of a change uh, just so that you can keep in sync with, with everything. Um, but you don't have to. Uh, that, that's the upshot. Um, but uh, as a recommended practice, just to keep things understandable, I would recommend that you do. Sean asks, if a pop-up window is not recognized, would Extended Find resolve this? Uh, potentially, Sean. Uh, if it's a situation where uh, the dialog is being dynamically generated as a child object of a particular page, then Extended Find might help. Uh, alternatively, wildcarding may help if the dialog itself has some sort of text in the title of it. I've seen this a lot with uh, folks who work in the insurance and the healthcare industries. They'll go to edit a patient, and when they click on the edit button, the dialog box that pops up will say, like, now editing patient, uh, you know, Arthur Curry. And then they try to run that against a different patient, and it fails because, you know, now uh, Beatrice Allen is on the the screen, but it's still looking for Arthur Curry. So wildcarding would fix that. Um, so that may help you. We said if I may help in that situation, but uh, if not, then definitely one of the other approaches that we've talked about today should should give you a hand. Okay. Um, just one other thing to talk about before we we close out here today, folks. Um, next slide. There we go. Just want to give you a preview of the coming attractions that we've got coming down the pipe here on uh, this Thursday. We're going to be having a webinar with the authors of a new book coming out called Making Software, What Works and Why We Really Believe It. Uh, you can register for that up on our website. And if you tweet about this webinar, uh, you, there is a chance for you to win a copy of the book from O'Reilly. And then one other thing to note is that next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel, 12 p.m. Eastern, right here with me, we'll be talking about testing rich Internet applications, specifically Silverlight, uh, with Test Complete. So uh, here... Working with uh, you know the new Web 2.0 type technologies, this might be something you'd like to check out. Okay, uh, again, thanks very much for your time and your questions today, folks. Uh, if you had questions that weren't related specifically to name mapping, please just send those over either to our support team or to uh, your account manager, and he or she uh, will help you out there. Okay, got another question coming in here from Corey, who's asking, uh, what's a good way to deal with mapping many controls whose parent containers may change over time. Okay, Corey, in that case, uh, the approach I'd recommend there uh, is probably going to be using extended find. Um, that way you can just focus on the controls that you care about. Um, if that doesn't work out, the other possibility that you could go with is if your developers can actually assign good uh, identifiers to your controls. So let's say that there are the default properties are all dynamically generated, but your developers can put in a special tag property on that, uh, that control that will always be constant. In that case, then you could create a name mapping template for using those controls so that you're never going to uh, have to worry about it. So I, I'd recommend either going the extended find route or going the, um, the name mapping template route in that type of situation. All right, folks. Well, thanks very much for your time and attention today. Again, this webinar was being recorded, so a uh, link to it will be made available uh, later on this week or early next week. Watch for that in your email. And in the meantime, go ahead and check out some of our new free tool offerings up at smartbear.com slash free. Uh, we've got a new uh, ALM solution there that's uh, free to try out. Uh, so please take a spin at that to see if it's something you'd be interested in. All right, folks. Thanks again. Uh, if you enjoyed today's presentation, my name is Nick. If you did not enjoy today's presentation, my name is Rodney.
Thanks a lot, folks, and have a great afternoon.